is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering the Wall of Storms, Part 4, Clash of Typhoons, and... Wait, that's Part 4. Then Chapter 57 and 58, A Plague and Dream of the Dandelion. In these chapters, we say goodbye to Kuni, who dies with great honor. And honestly, this one really got to me, you guys. I hated it. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Apologies if you can hear something in the background. Owen is vacuuming. Ms. T in the chat says she can't hear it at all, but sometimes it'll show in the recording, even if it doesn't on the crowdcast. Um, so, major event. Kuni Guru is dead. I was going to say commit suicide, and like technically that's true. But saying it that way makes it feel like a, a, when you say the words, quote, commit suicide, first of all, there's a real sort of tone to that, that feels a bit judgmental, honestly. And I know a lot of people feel that using the word commit makes it sound like sinful or criminal rather than the like act of somebody who is desperate and unhappy. Um, I feel like I I just kind of want to say he gave his life, you know, for the good of his people. He tried to do something that he could thwart the enemy with. Um, Ah, Ms. T says he stole his death from the enemy. I like that. Okay, I can I can feel that one. And honestly, uh, if if I was gonna try and like pick pick a way for him to die. This would not have been it. You know, I want Kuniguru to live until he's 95 and die surrounded by his great grandchildren. He was a good hearted person who'd wanted the best and maybe he didn't always do the right thing, but he did his best. He genuinely did, which is such a rare thing. And even to the end, He chose to do something that would benefit his people and make things easier for those who were fighting against his enemies, even though it meant sacrificing himself. And I feel that is just about the best you can ask for of somebody in his position. And I really like a lot of times in a major death scene when there are gods who show up or angels who show up or perhaps like a dead mentor who shows up, I often will be sort of eye rolly about it. But having the gods show up for his death, especially because it isn't actually after the moment of his death, it's right before. So he still has his own moment afterward where he is choosing how to behave based on the encouragement that he has just gotten from the gods. Something about it being in that order made it a lot more powerful to me and less cloying. It was more that they were letting him know what was waiting and telling him, you know, choose what you do next carefully because you only have a little bit left. So make it fucking count. And I'm honestly really surprised at how touched I was. I knew if anything ever happened to him, I was going to be devastated. I mean, I've known that since the first book, it was always possible that Kuni never makes it to the end. He's the driving force behind the beginning of the rebellion. And then who knows, you know, he could have started things and he doesn't actually become emperor or, you know, who knows what. So I've always been afraid of this. 
But this author has done such an excellent job of setting up his inheritors. And that is something that I think is really difficult to do when you have grown to care about a character like Kuni so much. I'm going to reference, um, Kyle says, if you remember Mapidere, the emperor from book one had the same kind of vision before his death, but missed the point entirely while Kuni goes with grace and understanding. I do not remember that Kyle. I like, I vaguely remember him having a conversation and it feeling like they said something to him that he took the wrong way. But I don't remember any specifics about how that happened or what they said to him. Um, but what I was going to reference was the show Vikings, which is a very good example of how not to do this thing. I wish they had been able to pull this off. And I'm going to do some spoilers here. So if you haven't seen past like season three of Vikings, you're going to want to skip the next like three minutes. But a major character in that story, the main character is Ragnar Lothbrook. And he is a gripping character played by a guy who is just hypnotizing. And you really care about him and enjoy watching him so much, even though he does not always do the right thing. In fact, sometimes he's a total douchebag, but you do often believe he is doing his fucking best. Same kind of like smarts, you know, and they do not adequately set up his, uh, inheritance or his inheritors, his sons, eventually he's killed. And his sons are too un... They're too sketchy. They don't have a lot of depth to them by the time he goes. So what the show attempts to do is draw them in after the fact and let us learn who they are dealing with this loss and whatnot rather than paint them as full characters and then remove him from the picture, which is understandable because television is a very different medium and you can do very different things. But I think this is an example that I would point to for a lot of people to just check out how to bid farewell to a beloved character without feeling like, oh, well, what's the point now? Because honestly, that's a little bit of the thing that happens in Vikings is, you know, you lose that character and you're just kind of like, now this doesn't even feel like the same show. I don't really care now. And that is not the case here. If, If anything, it's fascinating because you know how much Kuni accomplished and how capable the people he's leaving behind actually are. So it makes you want to know what happens next all the more because you have no doubt that they will be able to pull some shit off. It's just going to be very different. It's still going to be exciting. Um, so I'm going to back up here and we're going to talk about chapter 57. Almost a year had passed since the invasion of Dasu and Rui by the Liuku. A year. And this, first of all, it turns out that indeed uh, Timu's wife is, I hate even calling her that. I don't remember her name, though. Um, she is pregnant. And that is going to be one of the, uh, Tanvanaki, thank you, Kyle. That is going to be one of the, like, sort of bargaining chips that they plan to use is the fact that there is a legitimate heir. It winds up being very, God, can we just talk about Timu? Because I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. We have the whole, like, uh, Tenryo is angry because... Um, they, he says, you have not found a single source of Toliusa in all the islands of Dara. 
the Garinifin mothers are restless with child hunger and we won't get reinforcements until next year. How will we control the adults until then? Now, I don't remember if we learned what Toliusa was already. I'm assuming this is some sort of specific food for them, but I don't really remember. So I just kind of went on that assumption. Forgive me if I missed something. And we go right from there to Timu talking to Kuni. Guys, this is so painful. I hated this so much. Timu, he, he's talking to his father. And keep in mind, his father is a prisoner, right? Timu is very aware that enemies are all around him. And he really lays into Kuni in this way that I couldn't tell how much of it is genuine and how much of it is put on because he's trying to like keep the enemies from realizing maybe he, his heart isn't in this and how much of it is him attempting to put his heart into this because it's his only choice at this point. Like Timu is, has been left with no options so it's possible he's just leaning into this because it feels like there's nothing else he can do. And so he's basically trying to pretend that like he chose this marriage. Like this was something that he went into intending to be an advantage rather than, oh yeah, I was definitely raped, which is what we know this is the like... <clears throat> guys this is hard his conversation with Kuni is filled with the kind of accusations that wind up being thrown when a child grows up just enough to realize the wrongs that were done to them but they haven't grown up quite enough to totally understand the position that their parent was in I am very familiar with this place. The thing is, even when you do grow up enough to learn the position that your parent was in when they did something, that doesn't mean that they deserve forgiveness. It doesn't mean that you owe them forgiveness or that you don't have the right to feel the way you feel about whatever happened. But it does temper your words a little bit sometimes if you can understand what they were thinking or trying to do. But Timu is so, I believe, full of rage over what has happened to him, that he sort of redirects that at Kuni, when Kuni is not the one that he's mad at, but he can't lash out at the people he, who are actually responsible for what has gone on. And this is a thing that, that happens when people endure a really terrible trauma, especially when that trauma is something that they cannot be completely honest with anybody about, whether it be they were abused by a family member and they don't feel that anybody will believe them, uh, maybe a friend in, from a particular friend group, and they know that their other friends aren't going to believe. They internalize the hurt of it, and it winds up exploding out of them in unexpected ways. And I feel that's a lot of what's happening here with Kuni. Um, and there is a moment where Kuni actually seems to catch on to what actually happened to Timu. Um, because Timu doesn't tell him, I was forced into this, I was drugged. He doesn't, he's, like I said, framing this as if this is something he went into willingly, because he thought that this was the smart course of action. But there's this paragraph. The Liuku had been pursuing a policy of deliberately impregnating as many native women as possible, Kuni knew. Almost all of these pregnancies were the result of rape. The terror, violence, and brutality of the policy were designed not only to break the spirit of the native population, but also to affirm the Liuku claim to this land to put down roots in it. 
the women warriors of the Liuku had generally avoided becoming pregnant to preserve their own fighting readiness, and it was obvious that the Liuku princess's bond with Timu had been coerced. <sighs> so he, like, knows, but he can't say it, and Timu can't admit it, and overall, it's just the worst. And he says something like, Oh, you foolish child, you have read so many books and yet have learned so little. But Timu, I mean, he doesn't say to him, I know that you didn't pick this. I know that you didn't choose. You don't have to do this with me. And that hurts a lot. They Neither of them trust the other enough to like be straightforward with what's going on here. And honestly, it breaks my heart to know now Kuni is dead and they will never get to have that conversation. I didn't think they would. I didn't really. But I like hoped that there would be some sort of understanding. Reconciliation is too strong a word. But I hoped that... I'm getting so emotional. Timu tried so hard, you guys. He did so much in an attempt to be an example and and be smart. And to know that his father's like last conversation with him was laced with so much contempt from Kuni when Timu has tried so hard. It just sucks to know. More than likely, Timu is never going to get any respect for what he did. He's never going to get the credit he deserves for what he's been through and what he tried to accomplish. And I hate knowing what he endured was for nothing because that's what it feels like, you know. Um. So he tells Kuni, I ask you to step aside so that I can do what you cannot. Um, and just as you once seized power in order to wield it more justly, I now submit to power so that I can ameliorate its harsh bite. You and I are not so different after all. I have learned from you, father, but I learned from your actions, not your pretty words. You speak of caring for the people, yet you can't even take care of your own children. You speak of the responsibilities of power, yet all you've ever achieved is more power for yourself. You speak of the depredations of the Liuku, yet you are responsible for many more deaths. I'm going to be a father now, too, and I will never do to my child what you did to me. When the hegemon was about to capture you in Zudi, you were willing to abandon abandoned me and Ratatika just so you could escape. I remember that day as though it were yesterday. And then you abandoned mother to the hegemon and allowed her to live as a prisoner for years while you used her sacrifice to build your power. At least I will never do that to the woman I love. He says the woman I love, guys. Princess Vaju and I will build a new Dara together on the wings of the Garinifins, a world in which our child will not live in fear, doubt, or hatred rooted in ambition. I have striven all my life to please you, and you've never been happy with me. I'm tired of waiting for your approval, father. Tired of living in your shadow. <sighs> Brutal. Brutal. I hated it so much. Ugh. So then we have this letter that has been sent out to the people that basically asserts uh, Empress Gia is a power hungry usurper who has taken over her husband's throne because she just wants to rule and she's not thinking of what's best for you. Prince Timu and the princess are having a baby and are wed 
Emperor Ra- Ragan has abdicated in favor of the prince, even though that is not true. But who is to gainsay them saying this? Um, and he says all of this and then says, I'm delivering an ultimatum to the empress. In one month, we are going to fall upon the shores of Dara to reclaim the throne. All those who rally to the flag of the emperor, uh, Emperor Thake, which is apparently what they're calling Timu now, shall be rewarded, and all those who adhere to the usurper, usurper Gia shall be punished. Well, I mean, it's not a terrible tactic, honestly. Making it sound as if Kuni has, has abdicated to Timu? Before Kuni gets to do what he gets to do, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I hate that, like, they use these tactics that I'm kind of like admiring of. Um, now, Gia is reading this and says, I should have paid more attention to Timu's character instead of leaving him to his teacher. And says that he's broken his father's heart. This is a betrayal that it will be impossible to undo. I really love the fact that first, Thera says, okay, look, he had to have been deceived. Like, come on. I don't even think he buys this. And Rasana, who I swear to God, I am beginning to think is like, the, the secret MVP of everything. Rasana says, I'm sure that he had his reasons. Not everyone who collaborates with the Liuku is necessarily a traitor. Sometimes it's difficult to tell what people are really thinking based on their public performance. Rasana, God bless you and keep you forever. You sweet, sweet girl. Like, I just love the fact that she, out of everybody, has the most faith in him. You know, Thera is willing to be like, okay, he's clearly been lied to. The idea that he's been raped and forced into this position aside, he was lied to. I mean, she basically like manipulated him in the beginnings of their conversation, at least. But. Also, what she said about, like, the natives and whether, like, who gets to decide who really belongs here versus who doesn't. She was compelling in her arguments there. I just can't get past the fucking facts of what followed that conversation. Um, so I appreciate that Thera sort of realizes that Timu is, in the, like, something had to have happened. And Rasana is the one who's straight up, like... Yeah, we don't know what he's thinking. He's putting on some kind of show. That doesn't mean that we know what the fuck is going on here, though. I am extremely curious what would happen were Tanvanaki and the baby to be killed. Because Timu is, it feels, so taken in by this, like, I mean, it's like Stockholm Syndrome, you know? I can't tell how much of this he really believes, how much of this he was just saying because he had to, how much of this he is attempting to make himself believe because of his circumstances, and whether or not it has sunk in enough that were these mitigating factors that sort of forced his hand in this situation to be removed, how much he would continue along this same course, you know? Um, So... They begin talking about what this means. And Empress Gia is the one because everybody's sort of dancing around the issue. And she's like, come on, they're obviously trying to incite rebellion against me and get Dara to be destabilized because of that. I totally understand the way that they're doing this. And Thera says, but that plan works best if they give it more time. It would be more sensible for them to build up Timu's legitimacy, possibly by waiting until the child is born and wait for reinforcements from beyond the sea when the wall of storms opens in spring. So uh, Kyle says that we had not heard of what is it called? Toloya, something like that. And that this is the first we've heard mentioned of it. So I'm going to assume that this is some sort of like 
food that is crucial to the Garinifins, and that is why there aren't any of them here where we are. Like maybe it's something that's only like, but and when it, I say where we are, I mean in Dara, there aren't native Garinifins. And maybe that is because they require something from their diet that can only be found on the steps, you know, if they can't find anything to feed them with, that's just going to take care of that pretty quickly. I would imagine unless they're able to come up with some other means. Um, and, and I assume that is why they are wanting to hit sooner rather than later, because they're realizing that like potentially there could be something that goes really wrong with this, uh, food supply that I mean if they try and hit this quick is there a way to resist and and force them to uh, basically to not engage and force them to attempt I mean all right I'm getting ahead of myself Um, but at this point Gin Mazzotti is like, well, all right, we have to fight them. Like, this is what we have been preparing for. And while the odds are still not great, they aren't totally hopeless like they had been. And, you know, we're just going to have to do the best we can and also hope for some good luck as well. Then we go to the Lyuku. And I was very validated because this couple I have had suspicions were on the right side of things but just trying to bide their time as much as they could and it does seem that is exactly what was happening but it was impossible for us to see that from where we were standing so the Liuku intercept a bunch of mess- messages from these spies that are attempting to bring them into Dara um, into Rui and the they are these really complex ornate like quotes and poems and things that they're all sort of like laughing at and nobody can see that there is a message buried in here except for Raolu and Lady Lon Raolu is like I don't know. This is, there is something in here that to me means more than what just the poem says. And here are the lines. Um, Steadfast laborers paint the paddies green, promised golden grains put the mind at ease, but hunger and danger can't be foreseen when lured by the sovereign of the seas. Keep your silos filled and sealed, prudent king, for none can know what plagues the wind may bring. And they put it together that this is a poem that was written right before uh, there were these two warring kings. And one of them had gotten the king to essentially rely on the other's food supply. And he had gotten the king's own people to stop farming in favor of selling these oysters that he was willing to pay a fortune for. And so they began to drop off farming in favor of selling this oyster for an obscene amount of money because that was a bigger immediate gain. As a result, all of the farming began to fall to the wayside and rather than, I thought that this was interesting because I assumed that it was just going to be, um, let's see, at the same time, the king of Dio encouraged his own population to reclaim more land for farming and to plant varieties of rice, wheat, and sorghum with high yields. Claiming that Dio was poor, he paid the tributes he owed Kios in kind in the form of grain shipments. As a result, the king of Kios wasn't concerned that so much of the farmland of his domain was wasted because the tribute grain from Dio kept everyone fed. Indeed, his subjects were growing rich from the exorbitant sums paid by Dio for those silly oysters. Five years later, Dio suddenly stopped paying tribute. 
the granaries of Chios were empty because the people of Chios had not been farming for several years. While the population of Chios starved, the army of Dios swept across the border and conquered it easily. The king of Chios hung himself in shame before the army of Dio breached the capital. So that does sound like an effective fucking tactic. Get somebody absolutely dependent on you for a key item in their survival and then just stop giving it to them. Yeah, I guess that would fucking work, especially when that something is a food supply. You know, if he had dammed off all the water, it would be the equivalent. Um, so essentially, they begin to realize, oh, they're warning us that they're going to do something to the food supply. And they do this thing. First of all, Lon tries to say, if we survive, I'm certain the Empress will be grateful that we have understood the message and passed it on. And Raolu is like, sweetie, look, let's be honest. If we do this, we have to accept that they're going to kill us. It's the right thing for us to do. I definitely think we should do it. I'm not trying to ask you to die, but I know I probably will. And I am willing to accept that. And she's like, oh, well, if you're going to die, then... Yeah, I'll absolutely back you up. Ride or die, let's go. And I was just like, oh, you too. I was so glad to see that they were doing this. It made me so happy. But it was very sad because they do die. And it's not like... There's no ceremony to it. There's no drama. We don't see them executed. We just find out later that their heads are like on pikes. And there was something more heartless about that to me with this author just denying us the moment of the retribution they it's a given it's such a a foregone conclusion that they will be killed that the author just doesn't even spend time on it which i think was a good tactic and it's very effective but it kind of is a gut punch because of it you know so what they do is they convince pecutenrio to allow a low-key celebration of the autumn festival and basically, because Pecky was trying to be like, no, 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 we're not doing any of that. But Raulu is like, look, I get it. I get that you don't want to sacrifice productivity, yada, yada, yada. However, if you push the people too hard and take everything away from them, you're not really going to have any loyalty by the time. Like, you need people to be kind of on your side and to feel that they're not being totally mistreated. And... The best way to do that is at least allow some sort of concession so that you can say you've been so generous and so helpful. And what I recommend is at least allowing us to like distribute the traditional breads that we make at this time for our festivals. And um, we can, it says, let's see. We can have the bread distributed to each family so they can celebrate privately on the night of the festival. This will prevent the spread of rumors, avoid wasteful sloth, and still mark the occasion as festive. So Ra Olu and Lady Lon are managing to include small secret notes in these little biscuits. And it doesn't look like anything to the guards who examine the slips of paper and all of the paper are like, they all say on one side, things like good luck and, you know, great uh, uh, praises for the pecutenrio and, you know, wishes for fertility or whatever. But on the other side, written in invisible ink, I imagine lemon juice is a message that only shows up after the dough has been baked and the heat and the caramelization bring the message out of the paper. And it says, basically, we find out later to seal up the granaries with wax and clay, which they do. Um, so then we go to the ships north of the islands. And Puma Yemu is the master of this little 
organization, this little sneak attack. And uh, it's really weird because it's, it said um, that he had filled the cargo hold with things that would make people blanch. Only when the ships were at sea did he reveal to his crew what they were carrying, and more than a dozen had thrown up immediately, and a few had even dived into the sea to avoid having to live with the ship's cargo for a month. I had no idea what this was, and to be honest, the reveal that it was these locusts, I am not entirely sure that the fact that they vomited is super believable to me. I can totally understand being like, you know what? No, I'm not doing this. But a vomit reaction? Ah, uh, I don't know. That just feels like a lot. I don't know. Maybe he showed them one and the sight of the thing being as like horrifying as it is. Maybe that's what it is, is that they are just such a like monstrous mutant version of a locust. And that's particularly what gets to them. Um. But before we actually find out what they are, we get the like big moment when they're all let out. So he yells for the release and it says, um, they pried open the heavy cargo doors with long bamboo poles. Then they dove to the deck and lay with their bodies curled up to make themselves as unexposed as possible. Dark clouds emerge from the cargo hold, buzzing like an angry swarm of bees. However, the insects that made up the swarm were not bees, but locusts, each twice the size of a grown man's finger. Nope, don't like that. They're all basically the size of like a pretty big hummingbird. <clears throat> no, 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 no. Ugh. So... It says Prime Minister Kogo Yelu had carefully bred these locusts from the eggs left behind by the destroyed swarms in Gefika. These were the largest, strongest locusts Dara had to offer, and they were hungry, very hungry. So they just fucking descend like the Judgment Day and absolutely raise everything to the ground. And it is brutal to read about. And the Lyukus, I guess, have never encountered anything like this before. They try and fight back and they eventually just have to like retreat. And their it says their skin is blistered and their blood oozing because apparently these things like went after them. Um, long haired cattle stampeded and Garinifins took off overhead. Flocks of birds circled in wide placid circles as if observing a surging sea that had nothing to do with them. On the third day, after the locusts had swept over the entire island and denuded it of all vegetation, after they had turned on each other to fill their insatiable appetites, only then did the birds finally dive down and begin the process of cleansing the island of the insectoid plague. Afterward, as the dazed Liuku warriors and Dara peasants emerged from their hiding places, they saw a wasted world in which all the crop fields and grazing pastures had turned into a lifeless desert. For some reason, while the granaries in many of the villages had been sealed tightly ahead of time and preserved their contents against the plague, the haylofts and sheds where feed for the long-haired cattle and garinifin were stored had been left open and the locusts had mercilessly devoured the entire supply of feed for the Lyuku beasts of war. The villagers nodded at each other, finally understanding the message that had come to them in the moonbread. Seal up your granaries with wax and clay. So the granaries are preserved, but all of the other stuff is left open. So, Peki Tenryo kills Lady Lon and Raolu. I don't know how he knows they are the ones that distributed the message. I don't know how he is aware that they figured out how to do this. But he's not wrong. That's really the main thing. Um, and the villagers are told to open up the granaries and let the cattle and the garinifins eat the grain and the villagers are like, what about us? And they're basically like, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Essentially, it's a let them eat cake situation. 
I see plenty of pigs with two legs walking around. I think they make excellent food. You could learn to diversify your diet. Um, so the granaries are opened and emptied and all the grinifins and these cattle are allowed to feast on the food. And then all of the cattle fall down and begin to foam at the mouth. And some of them die. They're at the very least very ill. The Garinifins as well. And we find out later that Thera got some information that was very important from some of the ranchers, the cattle hands that she talked to from her grandmother's estate. And they told her, they tell her, first of all, that Lady Lou makes sure to grass feed all of her cattle because most people feed theirs grain and it gives her cattle the a totally like different flavor and she can charge more for it. But when she asks, I don't understand why you don't feed them grain sometimes. They are, they, they have to like, you know, kind of calm down after laughing because they're like, dude, they cannot handle a change up in their diet. Like if you feed them grain, you have to do that from when they are a calf. You have to do that. Wean them off of milk right onto grain. It's way too complex in their digestive tract to just introduce something totally new. Uh, and they can get, they'll definitely get sick, but they might die. So absolutely do not do that. And that's what gives Thera this sort of idea. She's like, oh, we can force them to have to feed this to their, you know, and cut off their food supply. Like, this is a pretty masterful stroke, honestly. Um, so I'm trying to figure out exactly, because I only have a little over 15 minutes left and there is so much left to get through. Um, I'm trying to figure out what are some good key things. All right, let's talk about Kuni. Um, he is trying to figure out what it is that Peku Tenrail will do next so that he can thwart him. And he begins to realize that as long as he's alive, they can tell everybody he abdicated and there's going to be no way to prove that that didn't happen. And if he dies in captivity, the Lyuku can pretend that he isn't dead for quite a while. And also, the Peku Tenryo is going to need a hostage to bargain with. And Timu, I mean, probably doesn't have the worth that he did at one time in that regard, because they're trying to act as if he's like a happy member of their family now. So it says he recalled a talk he had with Gia over the dangers of battlefield injuries and what could be done to save the wounded. He closed his eyes. It was time to put that knowledge into use. He looked and found a rusty nail in one of the window frames. He took off his left shoe and sock and scraped the skin against the rusty nail until he had made a deep gash. He grimaced against the pain and replaced the sock and shoe. Now he had to wait and hope that he would be given a chance. So he gives himself tetanus. And they wind up having to amputate his foot. But that does not save him. And we will get there. So Peku Tenryo begins to... Begins his invasion. And we go into chapter 58 here. And it says... As further insurance against a sneak attack, the flagship of the Peku displayed a bright red banner charged with the figure of a leaping blue Kruban. This was the Imperial Standard, and Peku Tenryo wanted to make sure that any Dara ship that dared to attack knew that they endangered the Emperor of Dara. So, this fuck. It doesn't work out so well, however. He underestimated Kuni's ingenuity and his willingness to die for his people. So Empress Gia tells Firo to stay in pawn and Firo predictably is absolutely horrified at the mere suggestion. And she's like, no, 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 
you're your father's only heir after Timu. And spoiler alert, that's not exactly true because she's only thinking but she says your safety is paramount. You sh- you should uh you will be the hope of an occupied Dara and he says and I can avenge you and she's like no. Oh my god, please no. Do not let that be the thing that rules you. That is just a waste. Just no, no, no. Freedom and the good of these people, that has to be what comes first. Vengeance, like distant nothing. And she tells Rasana and Yelu, if the gods decide that I should not return, the house of Dandelion is in your hands. And then we go to Gin Mazoti and she is talking to Gia. And I really liked this conversation because Gin and, and, and Gia, they just have this relationship that's so prickly due to the fact that they are both extremely headstrong women. And yet they have really come to an understanding where it feels like they have respect for one another again. And (sighs) Gia says, I love my husband with all of my heart. I know he would be willing to die for Dara. And the same is true of my son. Do you understand? And Gin is like, is the same true of your son though and Gia basically says I mean maybe he doesn't think that he is willing but he'll have to be made to be willing and Gin is like oh shit oh uh okay fuck And Gia says, I love my son, but evil must be confronted. So, uh, well, damn. Look, I hate this. I hate this. Timu deserves better in every regard, every facet of his life. He is a good hearted kid who deserves better. And I hate this for him. I want so bad for him to like manage to come out of this somehow. And I have no idea how that works, but I just really like, Oh, I feel so bad. I really do. Um, so Pecutenrio was growing more confident by the moment. He was going to land his army at Ginpen, sweep over the land like a bolt of lightning on the backs of the Grinifins, and bring Pawn to her knees in a single swift strike. Without any kind of effective air power, the walled cities of Dara could not withstand the might of the Grinifins. After all, could the marshal plant her flamethrowers everywhere? Bless him. He has no idea of what the fuck is coming. So Tenriel goes to speak to Kunigaru and is like, hey... It must really suck to see everything that you worked for just be worth nothing. And Tanvanaki, who is standing with him, distracts him and is like, what the fuck is that? And they see all of these mounds of bushes and and grass expanding like something's coming up out of them. And he's like, "Okay, some shit is definitely about to happen. And then all of a sudden, these ships, these new Imperial airships rise up out of the ground and Peku Tenryo is straight up just like how what do you mean the lift gas we cut off their supply they shouldn't be able to do this and turns out they're using that uh fermentation gas from the manure and they just completely restructure the way that these ships are built so that the frames of them are much lighter the shape of the balloons essentially that hold this gas are made much differently so as to be more effective because they need more gas to lift the frames. And they also have to, you know, only staff them with slender women because they are less heavy. And the, just overall, there have been a lot of changes made here. Um, The greatest weakness of the fermentation gas-powered airships, of course, was the flammability of their lift gas. If any of the gas bags sprang a leak, even a spark would cause the entire ship to turn into a fiery bubble. 
There was not much the marshal could do to reduce the risk, however, as any additional armor for the ship would have increased its weight beyond the power of the weak lift gas. She had to rely on the fortunate happenstance that the Liuku had not adopted the use of archers, especially not with fire arrows. For the same reason, the marshal had to eschew equipping the airships with flamethrowers. Instead, Mazoti would have to rely on other surprises. We don't get to see those surprises in this section, BT Tubbs. We get a hint of what they can do, what they are like, how they are made, but we don't get to see them in action. And I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, I also think it's interesting to point out that the Liuku have not used archers. I'm assuming that's due to the Garinifins and the fear of like shooting their own people. But um, the name of the Marshall's flagship is called the Silk Modic Arrow. And we find out the wheels the women now spun in the airship generated not threads or yarn, but power. Power that would be stored until it was needed. So I am wondering if they are going to be making, like, if this is how the ships are running, or if they're going to be using this, like, power as a, some sort of electric shock, like a I mean, that's still really playing with fire, literally, R.E., the flammable gas. So maybe maybe not. Maybe it's just the way these things are run. Um, excuse me. Uh, silk screens inside the gondolas hid most of the crew of the airships as well as the machinery they operated. Only about six women on each ship were visible from the fr- open door at the front, holding longbows with knocked arrows. The airships approached the Liuku fleet as Garinifins took off from the city ships, rising to meet this unexpected challenge. Below them, Liuku warriors scrambled around a golden canopy on the deck of the Pekyu's flagship, Pride of Ukyu. And Gin sees the uh, canopy that signals that Kuni is on that ship, and he tells them, target it. And it says she doubted that crafty Pecutenria would be so foolish as to make himself such an obvious target. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. She means the canopy. That's OK. I'm thinking that she's targeting the one with uh, Kuniguru in it. But that is a later thing. Um, so, yeah, they give some orders. Uh, the archers at the front of the airship point the tips of their arrows, at the golden canopy below. The Liuku warriors jeer as they saw the few archers crouched at the opening at the front of the gondolas. Men of Dara, the Pekyu's voice boomed. Stand down. This is the order of your old emperor. As they stunned Marshal Mazzotti and the rest of her crew watched, the golden canopy was whipped away to reveal a bed on which lay Kuni Garu. Kuni wasn't moving. So, Gin is looking at this and this is when she says target the emperor and everybody is just like oh fuck this is the right call but this really fucking blows it is a combination of things first of all kuni brought her to the position that she is in today however he also allowed her to be stripped of her titles and her power and did not stand up for her. And as it says, as long as Kuni remained alive, her forces would not be able to fight freely. Yet once she gave the order to kill him, she would never be able to free herself from suspicion that she had indeed intended to betray him. It was a price she had to pay to secure victory. To win, she had to give up her name and endure the judgment of history. Gin has grown. Do you see what that is? growth. This bitch would not have done this several years back. She would not have done it. Let's be honest. It has taken a minute for her to be able to like shelve her pride and her reputation and her legacy. It, this is a big moment. And I honestly was already like emotional over this moment. And then we go to Kuni. And he, it says Kuni looked around him confused. And it turns out that he's having a hallucination that he's in pan and in front of the palace 
and that all of the gods are here. And basically, he's like, um, did I do good? Did I do okay? And honestly, it really got to me, man. He he says something about how, like, I, I have a lot left to do. I can't go now. And one of the goddesses, Kana, is just like, yeah, dude, listen, everybody says that. I mean... There's never enough time. That's like kind of how it works. Um, and Rufizo says the tasks of great heroes are never done. Kuni felt both pride and sorrow at this. The gods of Dara had declared him a great hero, but he was never going to complete his dream. This was the way of the world, wasn't it? No matter how carefully you planned things, fate intruded. Have I made the right choices? Have I been a grace of kings? You have lived an interesting life. You've soared as high as a dandelion seed. You've dived as, dived as deep as a crew in. You betrayed reluctantly. You loved passionately. You sacrificed the affections of your children and wives. You were also a good father and husband. You defeated a tyrant. You brought peace to Dara. Thousands died because of you. Millions more were saved because of you. You tried to balance and accommodate competing interests. You strove to speak for those without a voice and wield power for those without influence. You know the world isn't perfect, but you've never ceased to believe it could be perfected. A new era requires new heroes. New pilots must guide Dara through the wall of storms. Go not gentle into the eternal storm, all the gods said together. So he opens his eyes. And it turns out the reason that he did this to himself, I had thought it was purely in the hopes that he would be dead before they could make this play, forgetting that if he dies in captivity, that's no win at all. It says he had planned to make himself so ill that the Lyuku would not place him in a cage so that he would retain the element of surprise. And all of a sudden, he gets his strength together and manages to pull away from the guards quickly enough and get himself into a position precarious and dangerous enough that nobody wants to make a move toward him because he could easily kill himself in response and they can't have that. And he yells, people of Dara. And he uses the speaking tube on the side of the ship so that everybody can hear him. I have sinned in my time. I have stood by as innocent men and women died for non-existent crimes. I have watched the helpless suffer while I saved my strength for another day. I betrayed a man as dear as my brother in the service of what I believed was a greater good, and I took petty vengeance on those who treated me ill in the past. Too often have I made decisions based on the long view, thinking that immediate sacrifices were acceptable for some ideal on the horizon." Though all life is an experiment, there are moments of purity of purpose that demand no justification. Today, Dara is under threat of a dark storm that has no comparison. There is no long view that can justify enslavement and capitulation. When the only alternative is death and servitude, I believe all of us know what must be the right choice. I name Princess Thera my successor, and Empress Gia shall be her regent until she is ready to take the reins of power. I order all of Dara to resist to the utmost until the invaders have been driven into the sea. He looked down and seemed to see the figure of Mata Zindu smiling and waving to him from under the sea, as though he approved of his speech. Thank you, brother, he whispered. Then he let go. His body plunged into the waves and did not emerge again. And then came the sentence that really fucked me up. Watching from a hidden observation post located in one of the shoreside caves, Thera, surrounded by a small detachment of palace guards, heard the speech and witnessed the death of her father as the surprised cry of sailors rippled from the Picu's flagship. There was something about the writing of that, witnessed the death of her father, that is so, like, clinical in its way but it's just I don't know it got to me it's not just saying Thera was so upset 
it's reminding us like she's watching her dad die. This is happening in front of her. You know, it's just, Oh, and she basically stuffs her sleeves into her mouth and bites down to keep herself from like screaming or crying because she knows he just named her his heir. She can't burst into tears. Now this is, that is not what she can do. And she basically resolves that she is going to fucking find Pecu Tenryo herself and she's going to take that motherfucker down. And honestly, I am 100% here for it and I would love to see it. Get it, girl. <sighs> emotional, guys. Emotional. And that is the end of this section. <sighs> I can't believe this. There's only, what, three episodes left now of coverage, I think? Ugh. These books are really good, you guys. Really, really good. <sighs> oh, my God. There's only two left. Kyle says, see you on Friday for the penultimate episode. Fuck. Penultimate. I thought that there was another one. Well, two left. Damn. Damn. All right. Thank you guys very much for listening. Thank you again, Kyle, for commissioning these. I hope you're enjoying the coverage. And I will see you soon with a new episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.